Um, he's going to be talking to us about cardiac physiology and tissue characterization. He trained at the University of Lund and um, now directs the cardiac MR group at uh, the Karolinska, where he um, has a well-funded juggernaut. And uh, welcome to Pittsburgh. So, thank you, Eric. All right, Dr. Shelburne. And also thank you, uh, Dr. Cavalcante, for uh, making all this happen with the check in the lights. <laughs> What's that? Check in the lights. Uh, sure. You don't have to turn it off. Yeah. There, that's it. So um, I'm from the Department of Clinical Physiology, and not everybody knows what clinical physiology is. In Sweden, we have a medical specialty called clinical physiology. And in clinical physiology, we do the non-invasive physiological testing, both in the heart, lungs, and, and vessels. So it's sort of like a diagnostic service specialty similar to radiology, but we do all the, the non-invasive diagnostic stuff, including cardiac MR, echo, stress testing, um, and uh, CT and nuclear for, on the cardiac side. And so we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, new approaches to cardiac pumping and myocardial tissue characterization by cardiac MR. And uh, this uh, image sort of represents the shift that we're seeing in MRI from the 1950s uh, thick CRT TVs uh, to now a thin, uh, widescreen, flat screen, color TV. And we're seeing that sort of technology shift in MR in a similar way, and we'll get a little bit back to that. Uh, so in summary, I'm going to talk the, uh, about two things. On the first half about cardiac pumping, a little bit about cardiac pumping revisited, uh, and then the second part about uh, myocardial tissue characterization <laughs> with MR. So both things that we do with MR. On the cardiac pumping side, it's more of a... Uh, Nothing technical about the MR, just more about understanding uh, how the heart pumps. Uh, and then the, the myocardial tissue characterization has some uh, MR technical aspects that I hope I won't uh, bore you too much with. Let's talk about the cardiac pumping first. Uh, and when it comes to cardiac pumping, there's, there's some new terminology maybe for the audience. Uh, total heart volume and total heart volume variation that we're going to talk about. And longitudinal, radial, septal, and lateral pumping. We're going to get to that. So let's start with total heart volume uh, variation. Uh, so let me ask you a, a rhetorical question. When you think about how the heart pumps, do you think of it more of the pumping that would occur when honking the horn of, a, of an old-fashioned bicycle, honk, honk, and you're sort of changing the outer volume of the heart? Or would you think of it more as the pumping of a bicycle pump, where you have a piston in a chamber going back and forth uh, without much outer volume change at all, or none in the case of the bicycle pump. How do you think of it? Is it a squeeze or is it a slide, if you will? And then that brings, to, brings us to think about some, some factors here. Um, on the one hand, what is the total heart volume in milliliters? What's the, what's the volume of the, in, the intrapericardial contents? Okay talk a bit about that. And what's the total stroke volume, the combination of the left and the right ventricular stroke volumes in milliliters? And how much does that total heart volume vary during the cardiac cycle in percent? So let's talk about that. Um, here, uh, visually, we have a short axis slice. Maybe you've seen something like that before uh, in echo or in MR for that matter. And it seems like I don't get to point particularly, but that's the, we see the, the left ventricular wall is thick er than the right ventricular wall, we have the septum in between, and, uh, but not a lot of outer volume variation visually. And then we have uh, the, the three long axis slices that we also are recognized from echo, the four chamber view, and the top right, the four chamber view, bottom right, the, the LB outflow track view, and the bottom left, the uh, two chamber view as a normal uh, individual. So let's talk about that, that normal heart. Uh, here we have a schematic. Uh, showing the four chambers, the left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, and right ventricle. And I'm going to take the opportunity uh, to call upon uh, Dr. Gorsi, who I met last night. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to ask you a little bit interactively here, and put you on the spot. Uh, and I, I warned you a little bit, but I didn't tell you what I was going to put you on the spot about. But here, let's go. So let me just slide this thing out of the way here. Maybe slide it down. What would you say... Dr. Gorson, if you had to guess, and I, I don't expect you to know because it's, these aren't volumes that we talk about regularly in, in the routine of care, but if you had to guess, what would be the volume of my heart? Let's assume I'm, I'm healthy. 
uh, and what would be the total heart volume of the intrapericardial content. So left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, all that stuff inside the pericardium, if you had to guess. Um, for you being an adult male, I'd say your end diastolic volume, we're talking about end diastolic End diastolic of the whole heart, not just the left ventricle. The ventricle is about, I'd say, let's say 110 mLs, and the right ventricle is relatively equal, so we're up to 220. Mm -hmm. And then we add uh, 20 each for the atria. Mm -hmm. So my guess would be 20, 40, 260, uh, 260 mLs. So that's the blood volume, but you also need to include the, the myocardial volume as well. So the LV mass, RV mass, and the atrial masses as well, because you want everything that's inside that egg that is the, the pericardium. So of what use is this number? <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> give, me, give me a leap of faith that we're going somewhere with this. <laughs> And let's just let's let's uh, add those masses okay, on there. So I'm familiar to, with measuring um, chamber volumes, but not with the mass. So uh, well, say what's a normal LV mass? Uh, something that we could say grams and, and mils equivalent. Uh, something that we think about. Okay. But so you have to add, add, add some more then. Yeah, add add some more. So you're talking about. In MLs, but you don't measure the wall in MLs, it's in dreams. Yeah, but we're just making a guess here. We don't okay, so what was I at? I said 260. Yeah. So uh, 360. 360. And this is the kind of guesswork that uh, is very typical of myself before we started measuring it with MR, and also your random senior cardiologist that you talk to in, a, in an audience like this. Turns out it's a, it's a, it's a lot larger. It's about uh, 800 mils. Let's see, should be getting that here. Uh, oh, there, so we got 800 mils. Uh, and if that's, if you measure it with MR, slice by slice, you slice up the entire heart in a short axis from the apex to through, through the atria, and you get everything that's inside the pericardium. So then what would you say, uh, John, would be the left ventricular stroke volume approximately? I think you're setting me up for trick questions. <laughs> yes. yes, I am. But it's, it's not, it's not Ill, Ill, there's no mal, malintent. So in, in what, how are we measuring this? What do you... The stroke volume, the amount of blood ejected from the left ventricle during each, during each heartbeat. That's a normal stroke volume. Uh -huh. Uh, 60 to 100 mLs. Sure, and I, I think we should we'll go 100 because I have I, I have a little bit athletic in my in my high school years at least. So let's give me 100 mil, mils of a stroke volume in my left ventricular stroke volume. If my left ventricular stroke volume is 100, what would my right ventricular stroke volume be? It should be very similar in a normal situation. I agree, and so let's give me a, a 200 milliliter total stroke volume. So of these 800, I got one right. <laughs> uh, so let's say of these 800 mils that the entire heart has, it's ejecting 200s in every heartbeat, right? So then, what would be the outer volume change in, in milliliters or percent every heartbeat? Again, if you had to guess. So that's something that would be like that. How much is the outer volume changing of the heart? How much is it squeezing? How much volume change are we seeing in the pericardial like set? The total heart ejection fraction. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I would say it's, it's similar to a left ventricular or right ventricular ejection fraction per second. So, so if those 200 out of 800 were all being caused by squeezing, right? If all of the 200 milliliters of total stroke volume were caused by squeezing, we would have 200 divided by 800 as the total heart ejection fraction. But in fact, it's much less than that. It's only about 8%, as visualized by the dotted lines on the left. Where's your boundary mark? Is that the, is that the epicardium? Yeah, the epicardium, the pericardial sac, mm -hmm. with, with negligible amount of fluid in the, in the pericardial space. Do you include that? No. Just... Um, so it's my 
And so that's a little weird. So if the, if the outer volume is only changing by 60 mils, how, how the heck are 200 getting ejected each heartbeat? Ah, and that's where we get to the, 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 the answer to that question. So the total stroke volume was only 60 out of 200. So only 30% of pump, cardiac pumping is being caused by these outer volume changes. And we choose to call that radial pumping. But there's more, somewhere, something else. And, and Dr. Wang mentioned that, that the, uh, there's, there's blood entering the heart as well. Uh, and that's happening during the time that the AV plane is moving towards the apex in systole. Slightly more on the right side and also on the left side. And we see that the longitudinal component due to inner volume shifts while the chambers, uh, the, the ventricles are ejecting, the atria are filling. It's a little bit exaggerated in this schematic, but as the, as the ventricles eject, the atria fill, and thus we can pump out more than the total outer volume changes. And it turns out that the, the balance on the, total, on the whole heart side is about 70-30. 70% of, of cardiac pumping is due to longitudinal pumping or inner volume changes due to the AV plane movement, and 30% due to the outer volume changes or, or the radial pumping. So how much is that on, for each ventricle? Let's see if we can get that. There we go. And we see there that about 60% of the left ventricular stroke volume is coming from AV plane movement or the longitudinal pumping and 80% on the right. And then there's also a little component of the septum moving leftward uh, during the normal uh, heart pumping, contributing 5% to the left ventricular stroke volume and stealing 5% from the right ventricular stroke volume, leaving us with 35% lateral or, or uh, radial pumping on the, on the left side and 25 on the right. So if we sum that up, Left ventricular stroke volume, 60% of that stroke volume is generated by the AV plane, 40% by radial pumping, five of which come from the septum and 35 from the lateral wall. And on the right-hand side, on the right ventricular stroke volume, 80% of right ventricular pumping, right ventricular stroke volume is generated by longitudinal pumping, the AV plane movement, and 20% by radial pumping, 5% loss on the septum and 25% being generated by the lateral wall. And these are measurements that we've been able to to do by MR, and so why is that interesting? Well, first of all, how, how do we know these things? How do we know that they're true, and why is that interesting? And let's talk a little bit more about that. So here's, a, here's an illustrative image. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have the end diastolic volume uh, of the whole heart. We have the whole heart pericardial borders uh, outlined, including the AV plane and the, uh, the epicardial uh, portion of, this, of the left ventricular septum, or the, the interventricular septum. And then on the right-hand side, we have the dotted and dashed lines, the corresponding end systolic positions of those, and then the, the schematic on the right. Uh, this is adapted from, from, uh, from the publication there. And uh, we don't just measure it in this one slice, we measure it in all slices. From apex to base, we get full 3D volumetric coverage to, 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 cover, to measure these measurements uh, in, in, all, uh, in all slices, in, in all time frames. So it looks like this. We can get a short axis stack uh, going from the apex of the left ventricle all the way to covering the, the base of the, of the atria. And then we delineate the uh, epicardial border of the left ventricle and right ventricle. And even in, in this case, uh, uh, you can see in the bottom right corner, there's some uh, of the, uh, some, some intrapericardial fat that's being uh, redistributed that we see outside the right ventricular wall. So it's not uh, pericardial fat, but epicardial fat is included. But then we also have other methods to measure things by MR. We have phase contrast velocity encoded imaging to measure flow. We can measure flow in the MR scan. On the top right, we have a frontal plane. Oh, here we have the slice, and here we have the ascending aorta. And we, if we prescribe a slice right through the ascending aorta there and through the pulmonary trunk right there, we get this image here on the bottom left. We have the chest wall in the front. We have the spine here in the back. We're seeing the patient from below. Uh, so we're at the patient's feet looking up towards their head. And we see here the ascending aorta right here and the pulmonary artery bifurcation. If we then prescribe uh, a circle uh, where we measure the area of the uh, aortic cross-sectional area, but also the velocity, uh, we can measure flow. So this is the through plane velocity. That's velocities going through the image plane with velocities according to this color scale. So bright 
is a positive velocity going up towards the head, and black here in the descending aorta is going towards the, the feet. And the, the product of area and velocity becomes uh, centimeter squared times centimeter per second, becomes centimeter cubed per second or milliliter per second. So we have the flow in milliliters per second at each time frame and can very accurately measure the, the flow coming out of the aorta or any of the larger vessels uh, in the heart. It turns out this is the most accurate method we have for measuring, quantifying flow in the large vessels of the body, far more accurate than the assumptions inherent to, for example, Doppler uh, or even the variability in uh, thick determinations, for, for example, cardiac output. Uh, so we did that, uh, or we, the, my, my colleagues did that. I wasn't a part of this paper, but it was the work up to my, some of the, uh, the, the work that we, we've done. And here we see the flow uh, in the aorta. We have the flow in the pulmonary trunk. And we have flow in the, in the two cable veins and in the four uh, um, pulmonary veins. So we have now quantification of all flow into and out of the heart through all of the great vessels. And these are, these are actually determined by two observers, and they're very uh, re reproducible. You see both observers' uh, delineation uh, results are on top of each other. So with that, one, if one knows all the flow in and out of the heart, one can measure the, the difference between inflow and outflow as the volume change of the heart. And that, in fact, we used to, uh, was used to validate. It would say method A was volumetric measurement, where we were drawing circles in all the images, and volume B is the derived volume from the flow measurements. And you'll see in these eight healthy subjects, I believe uh, I, w I was a participant in this study as number eight, uh, as it were, with a a volume of around 950 uh, at end diastole, and we see perfect, uh, almost near perfect correspondence of the volume changes measured by derived volume from flow or measured volume as the volumetric thing, uh, volumetric measures. And on average, it's about 800 mils for a, uh, for a uh, healthy individual to, as their end diastolic total heart volume, and their total heart volume varies about 60 mils or 8% of that. So that's how we got to the to know and understand that the total heart volume uh, has a given volume and what it, how much it varies. So why is that interesting? And, uh, who cares? Well, uh, let's take the next step to longitudinal, radial, septal, and lateral pumping. Uh, and here we see uh, epicardial delineations of the left ventricle in red and the right ventricle in green. And we see, here we can see those slight variations in the epicardial uh, volume of the ventricles, but also uh, can appreciate the AV plane moving back and forth uh, very uh, more prominently, relatively, the epicardial changes. Uh, and this is work that, uh, that we did uh, at Lund University when I was uh, there during my um, postdoctoral uh, period, even though I also did my PhD training there as well. Uh, and this sort of uh, is the, based on delineations from the MR images. And so how do we know that the longitudinal pumping, in fact, is uh, what we say it is? Well, what we did was we in MR, it's possible to prescribe uh, images uh, in a radial orientation. So one image here, the dotted line, that represents this image here in endiastole, very similar to a two-chamber view uh, from ECHO. We have the uh, left atrium, left ventricle. We've seen the left atrial appendage even here. And we've delineated the epicardial uh, portion of the, of the of the um, left ventricle in end diastole. And then in end systole, we've just sl slid this, this portion uh, and slid it down uh, and, and see this volume of, of how much the AV plane is moving. Uh, so uh, and we see that there's also some volumes, for example, here where there's a radial movement. But just the longitudinal movement is about moving the position in the apex word direction. It turns out when we volumetrically validate this, the way that correctly uh, determines the longitudinal component of pumping is the product of the AV plane movement and the largest uh, cross-sectional uh, area of the left ventricle in the, uh, the epicardial cross-sectional area. So that's a little bit counterintuitive some, to some people. Why would we be measuring stroke volumes using the epicardial portion of the left ventricle? Normally in echo, we delineate the endocardium. So uh, let me ask you again, John, if I may, uh, the left ventricular mass uh, in end, di end diastole and end systole, would you get, think that the, the mass of left ventricular myocardium changes over the cardiac cycle or does not change over the cardiac cycle? The amount of myocardial tissue 
No, I, I think Sir Isaac had it right that it's conservation of mass, that it, it should not change unless it defies laws of Newtonian physics. Exactly. In the same way that my biceps, my massive biceps, uh, are have, have a given volume here and a given volume here, the volume is going to be the same, but it's going to be in different places. And there may be slight changes in the blood volume of the myocardium throughout the cardiac cycle, but they're negligible uh, from, the, from this standpoint. So we can measure the stroke volume as the change in endocardial volume or epicardial volume. It doesn't matter because the mass is equivalent, and that's also been shown uh, with data. Uh, but it turns out that the, we have to use the epicardial uh, area of the short axis of the left ventricle when we multiply it by the atrioventricular plane uh, movement to get that true uh, longitudinal component of left ventricular pumping. And so we did that. What we did, the, the radial function was that which was not longitudinal. Uh, and the longitudinal defined by this volumetric approach that we had. And here we have the outer volume variation. Uh, uh, and we see here both for the right heart and for the left heart an excellent correspondence between radial function determining as, determined as that pumping component of the left ventricular stroke volume and the right ventricular stroke volume that was not uh, caused by the longitudinal component, and that corresponded excellently to the volume variation, uh, both for each ventricle as such and the total heart volume variation compared to that uh, total radial function. So that was the, sort of the, the validation work to understand the longitudinal and radial components. It's a little bit uh, tricky sometimes if you talk with uh, someone who does a lot of echocardiography. I do a lot of echocardiography as well. Uh, you say, what's the, how much is the short axis pumping of the left ventricle? They say, oh, it's the fractional shortening maybe of the, of the luminal diameter of the, of the left ventricle. Turns out that that's dependent upon the left ventricular mass. If I have a very large biceps mass, then the, more, the, the larger my biceps is, the more when I contract it, the greater it's going to thicken in this direction. Same thing happens in the left ventricle. So we have to be careful when using endocardial measures of radial pumping. It has to use, we have to use epicardial measures. And that's a, not an immediately intuitive approach, but it turns out it was necessary to, to get uh, the, the numbers to, to agree. So when we did that uh, in, uh, for, for a, a series of healthy individuals, we saw that for the total heart, it was about 60-40 between longitudinal and radial. The left, sorry, 70-30, and then for the left heart, about 60-40, and for the right heart, about 80-20. But then we, we, uh, we wondered, so how does that change in disease? So here we see uh, a series of controls, uh, athletes, endurance-trained athletes, and patients with uh, reduced ejection fraction and dilated cardiomyopathy. And we see that the AV plane displacement in millimeters was similar between controls and athletes, and reduced in patients, patients have a reduced mitral annular plane systolic excursion or AV plane displacement. Uh, the stroke volume was slightly higher in athletes with a lower heart rate, similar cardiac outputs to the, to the controls, but uh, it's understandably the patients have some kind of failure and some kind of reduced uh, stroke volume on average. But the stroke volume that could be attributed to the AV plane displacement or the longitudinal pumping was very similar across the board. So the longitudinal contribution to the stroke volume uh, is unchanged even when you reduce the ventricular pumping capacity. Uh, in part, that's a, a product of the larger uh, cross-sectional area of the dilated left ventricle uh, in combination with that AV plane movement. But um, yeah, it's, it, this was sort of uh, us trying to understand what does this longitudinal pumping component really mean. It turns, it turns out it's quite preserved across different uh, physiologies and pathophysiologies. But then the next step is to understand, well, is there a septal component as well? So here on the top, we have a, a healthy individual where the, sep the epicardial portion of the septum has been delineated in, in end diastole. And in end systole, we see how the left ventricle steals a little bit of its stroke volume from the right ventricle, those 5% we were talking about earlier. But here we have a patient uh, uh, with fellow uh, who's been uh, corrected, but has a severe pulmonary regurgitation, as is often the case. Uh, and it's uh, often a question of should, when should we go in and do, uh, take care of that uh, pulmonary valve. Uh, and here we see that the, the septum goes in the other direction. So in severe pulmonary regurgitation, the septum is helping out the right ventricle. Uh, and that's, maybe it's a little bit intuitive because if you have severe pulmonary regurg, let's say you might have a 50% regurg. Well, you have to pump out 200 mils 
in order for it to regurge 100 mils to have an effective forward stroke volume of about 100 mils that can be done uh, for, as a number in this case. Uh, so the right ventricle needs help from the left ventricle, and that also occurs volumetrically. And what was developed uh, by the group was the ability to do this not just in one slice, but volumetrically throughout the entire uh, left and right ventricle to know what portion of the stroke volume for, uh, on, on a volumetric level is the septum contributing to. And in normal physiology, the septum is helping the left ventricle, and in uh, disease, it's helping the right ventricle. And here we see that uh, in numbers, in healthy children and children with severe PR, we see on average 5% contribution uh, of the, to, to septal contribution to left ventricular stroke volume, but uh, on average almost 10% septal contribution to right ventricular stroke volume, and similar patterns are seen uh, in adults as well, uh, healthy adults and adults with a pulmonary, severe pulmonary regurg. So uh, this methodology of understanding the septal contribution to pumping wouldn't be possible if we didn't also understand the longitudinal contribution from the AV plane in relation to the lateral or radial contribution from uh, outer volume changes and the squeezing. And uh, uh, we're seeing now that now that we, uh, that this methodology is available, there are a number of other pathologies which we haven't addressed yet where intraventricular coupling can now be quantified volumetrically. We can say how much is are the right and left ventricles helping or not helping each other. Uh, and that's, so this methodology has been necessary in order to do those kind of uh, explorations. And also now we can go home and sleep much better at night knowing that the total heart volume ejection fraction is only 8% as opposed to 65%, which we normally think of for just the left ventricle. It gives us a little bit of new insight in, in, into cardiac pumping. So it's not so much outer squeezing of that, of that honking of the horn. That's on the whole heart, about 30%. The major contribution is coming from the AV plane movement or that piston that goes back and forth uh, inside the heart, the inner, inner volume, longitudinal pumping. So we talked about total heart volume variation, longitudinal, radial, and septal pumping, and lateral pumping. Here we see the AV plane as it like piston-like moves back and forth within a heart with relatively small outer volume changes. But let's now take a step on, uh, into a different uh, direction in myocardial tissue characterization. So on the one hand, how were things pumping? On the, other thing, on, on the other hand, how is the tissue doing? So uh, we all have uh, been exposed to the cardiac imaging modalities, magnetic resonance, nuclear imaging, CT, and echo. And we've, we've learned that there's a considerable overlap. There are many patients where it could be almost equivalent to do uh, a, a given study uh, for, uh, with any of the modalities. But the interesting part is where does the respective modality have a unique niche? What is that unique slice that ECHO is unique for CT, nuclear, and MR? So I'm going to talk about this sort of the, the uniqueness of the slices of, of, of MR, which sort of justify why we have uh, MR as a part of our, our workup um, uh, options. And one of, that, one of the key uh, added benefits of MR, there are many, but I'm going to focus on myocardial tissue characterization. On the one hand, myocardial scar. I'm going to talk about things like T1 mapping and extracellular volume mapping, if you may have heard of or not. We've talked about that today. And, and myocardial perfusion imaging uh, by MR quantitatively. Let's start with scar. So here we have a, a short axis uh, data set running from the mitral valve plane all the way down to the apex, the top row is the cine images, the bottom row is the late gadolinium enhancement or scar image. And here we can see, I think you can appreciate, for example, this anterior wall is not moving the fastest, but the anterior wall in this slice here is uh, almost standing still, it's akinetic, and the corresponding region on the scar images is this white area of transmural uh, infarction. So white uh, infarction become, or any scarring becomes white, and healthy myocardium, or at least non-scarred myocardium, becomes black. But you can also have regions here where there's minimal subendocardial scarring, largely black wall, but still pumping poorly uh, in that region. So that helps us in the setting of ischemic workup to determine this transmurality of scar, which predicts uh, the likelihood of functional recovery. If there's 100% transmural scar, there's a very low or negligible likelihood of, of functional recovery following revascularization. And we use that on an everyday basis. 
Uh, and there's a strong prognostic value there. Here we have uh, an ischemic scar, infarction in the lateral wall, uh, almost transmural scar there. Here we have myocarditis with mid-wall uh, patches. And here the long epicardial uh, wall, lots of patchiness here, uh, non-ischemic pattern. Here we have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and a thickened left ventricle <coughs> with a focal scar there, a little bit more diffuse scar in here. But the, 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 the story is very similar in all cases. The late gadolinium enhancement, as it's called, if the absence or presence, here we see five-year uh, event-free survival, once you have scarring, whether it's ischemic, non-ischemic, or non-ischemic and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the story goes again, dilated cardiomyopathy, scar, focal scarring of the myocardium is a bad thing to have. And we can only see it uh, if we do an MR study. Uh, the other uh, modalities that we have are not as good at showing it. But let's talk about scar a little bit more detailed than that. And there's different types of fibrosis. Fibrosis is a word that's used uh, sometimes a little bit sloppily uh, by colleagues when talking about changes in the tissue. On the one hand, we have replacement fibrosis, what I would call scar. That's the kind of thing that's a focal event. It's a high severity of damage. Uh, here we have blue is collagen, uh, green is a fibroblast, this is a capillary, the red are uh, myocardial, uh, myocardiocytes, and there's a lot of collagenous scar, a focal high severity lesion, something that we see after chronic infarction, non ischemic scar, or other reasons for focal scar. But that's a different beast than diffuse reactive fibrosis. Here we see just a general increase in collagen between the cells. This is a global disease of low severity of change. And it's the kind of changes we see in aortic stenosis, diabetes, hypertension, and others. And focal, focal fibrosis and diffuse fibrosis are two different beasts. And it would be good to be able to see both, both of them. Uh, and that brings us a little bit into T1 mapping. Uh, this is a picture uh, I took uh, in Georgetown, uh, D.C., when I was living there working at the NIH as a postdoctoral fellow. It was during snowpocalypse 2010. And uh, uh, about uh, three feet of snow came in two days. You might, have, might even uh, have heard of it and remember it. Here we see the cars completely drenched in snow. But it also illustrates a little bit of the challenges in MR, and that is how bright is bright? Can we trust the signal intensities of a given image to say that something is so and so much damaged? And that turns out to be a challenge. Here we see lots of snow on the car, intermediate amounts of snow on these branches, and very little up here in the windblown branches up there. It would be lovely if we could measure the amount of snow, if you will, in the, in the MR images. But that is a challenge, it turns out. MR signal intensities vary across the image in conventional MR images. So here, if we look at the, uh, the epicardial fat, it's very bright here. Uh, sorry, the subcutaneous fat is very bright here. And as we tail off to the uh, corner of the image, it becomes darker. Here we see a bright blood signal in the atrium, and it becomes darker as we go into the apex. So image intensity varies across the image for uh, tissue of the same quality, and it's presented in arbitrary units. And that's a point of frustration uh, for us in the quantitative uh, world of, of MR. But to the rescue, we have something called T1 mapping. Uh, in short, uh, signal will vary after the time of manipulating the signal magnetically, and that varies according to a known uh, uh, laws of physics where the curve fitting of that signal over time can be uh, used to determine the, uh, the T1 value, which is the time constant of longitudinal relaxation, as we call it, uh, the time constant for how that tissue uh, is measured in milliseconds. So for one given pixel in the blood pool, there, 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 that same pixel in every image has this signal intensity over time. When you curve fit it, you get 1,695 milliseconds. That one pixel in the myocardium, there, there, and so forth has another curve fit, and it has 898 milliseconds. And we can do that for every pixel in the image and get a T1 map. And that has now become uh, practical to do. Now we have signal intensities that have a unit which is not arbitrary, it's in milliseconds, that, that time constant. And we can compare, even within the image, uh, the septum to the lateral wall, the anterior to the inferior wall, the blood pool. Here we see considerable variation in the blood pool in between the anterior and the inferior wall, for example. So there's an advantage there to doing T1 mapping, which is then based on these time constants. Why is that interesting? Well, this is a study we did uh, in the dog where we did L LED uh, occlusion and reperfusion. Uh, on, the, on the right here, we see the TTC stain, where white is infarction, red is viable myocardium. Here we have the microsphere study where we injected uh, small microspheres 
uh, in the uh, arterial circulation in the left atrium that went out into the coronary uh, distribution, and we can measure that in milliliters per minute per gram through calibration through a, um, a calibrated uh, extraction from the arterial system uh, and uh, enzymatic degradation of the tissue and quantifying the microspheres in that. And we see that the area that was occluded, this was an injection during occlusion, and this is the final infarct size, the occlusion area was larger than the infarcted area, and they showed up quite nicely and uh, very equivalently on both the T1 map, which is the T1 time constant, and the T2 map, the T2 time constant. Uh, and this is the area that's uh, more than two standard deviations from remote. So what this study showed us experimentally was that the edema in uh, myocardial reperfusion injury uh, beyond the, the area that was uh, infarcted can be quantified using just, uh, in this case, a T1 mapping or T2 mapping equivalent, but importantly, T1 mapping. But T1 mapping can be used to do a, look at a number of other uh, tissue characterizations. Here we see uh, iron overload uh, with just T1 mapping in the absence of any contrast media. Uh, we go from, from normal to almost a dark blue on this color scale of T1, through, indicating a high amount of iron deposition in the myocardium. Here we see uh, Fabry's disease, control and Fabry's disease. It gets almost blue here. And uh, even though Fabry's disease may have scarring in the lateral wall, it's their non-scarred myocardium, which has a sphingolipid deposition, as in the pathology of Fabry, which we can detect almost uniquely now with uh, MR in the absence of contrast. And here we see uh, this, the measurement of T1 in Anderson Fabry disease is uniquely low compared to hypertension, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, aortic stenosis, and amyloid gets an increased T1, which is an interesting diagnostic uh, opportunity, which we also use it for. Uh, but T1 mapping alone in the absence of contrast gives us some kind of information about inflammation or iron or fat, depending upon whether it goes up or down. But how about the extracellular volume mapping? What is that? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, the contrast agent that we use in, in uh, MR distributes into the extracellular space. It's a small enough molecule to pass across the vascular wall into the interstitium, but it's a large enough molecule that it will not pass the cell membrane. So that, therefore it's called a, an extracellular agent. So if we knew how much contrast was there, we could quantify that extracellular space potentially. And we embarked upon doing that. We measured the T1 before and after the administration of the gadolinium-based contrast agent. We did the inverse of T1, 1 over T1 gives us R1, and the difference in R1, R1 pre minus post, gives us delta R1. Delta R1, uh, we know, is linearly related to contrast agent concentration. So if you can measure T1 before and after administering a contrast, you can measure the relative contrast agent concentrations in that image. And if you also know that that contrast behaves in a certain way in its biodistribution, we can calibrate, for example, the blood pool as a known uh, uh, extracellular space, being one minus hematocrit from the venous sample of hematocrit. In short, after doing the smart math, you get this image on the bottom right. A color image now, which has a scale from zero to 100% representing the fraction of tissue comprised of extracellular space. That's quite convenient because there are a number of myocardial pathologies that uniquely disturb the fraction of tissue comprised of extracellular space, whether it be necrosis, fibrosis, inflammation, edema, um, and let's talk about that. So one of the validations that was done uh, coming out of uh, London uh, was looking at the fibrosis in aortic stenosis patients undergoing uh, open surgery for aortic valve replacement. They did transmural needle biopsies of the left ventricle. So they plunged the needle through the entire left ventricle, which can be done safely if the needle is small enough, and then did picroserious red collagen staining. And we see here a small amount of collagen, 4%, 12%, 34%. And that corresponded excellently linearly to the myocardial extracellular volume fraction. So if you know your pathology, uh, you will see this uh, very uh, excellent correlation to the collagen volume fraction determined histologically. And that turns out to be absolutely outstandingly prognostically beneficial. This is work coming out of uh, uh, work from Dr. Shelbert here in Pittsburgh, together with Dr. Wong, and looking at the uh, survival through the different tertiles of myocardial extracellular volume fraction. So if you have a low myocardial extracellular volume fraction, your survival is, is good to excellent, and as it gets higher, it's much poorer. 
And this is extremely powerful. We've, uh, thanks to this tool that uh, we as a field now have, we've learned through the continued work and collaboration between uh, with, with Dr. Shelby and Wong, is that uh, this, is, this is more powerful than ejection fraction. The myocardial extracellular volume fraction is more prognostically powerful than ejection fraction. That blows me away. And uh, I, 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 I wouldn't want to be assessing a patient without knowing that. We use it routinely on all our patients and, and report it clinically. And there's a discussion in the field uh, with how we should move forward with this. And we're finding it extremely useful, both on a clinical note and also with the scientific basis for it. So this is how we use uh, our clinical reporting of the combination of T1, native T1 in the absence of contrast, and ECV based on T1 mapping before and after contrast. We see that we have a normal range uh, of, pa of patients, but then if you have, we talk about the settings of increased ECV, if you have primarily an increase of ECV, but not so much an increase in T1, it's a, it's a fibrotic process, non-inflammatory process, which is low grade when it's diffuse fibrosis and it's global, and it's focal and high grade in the setting of SCAR. Uh, we can see concomitant increase in both ECV and T1 in amyloidosis globally, focally in acute infarction or necrosis. We have primarily inflammatory processes that give drive a higher T1, but not so much ECV, both at, at focally and uh, globally. We have reduction in T1 in Fabry and iron globally, and we have concomitant reduction focally in thrombus and in fat. So the combination of T1 and ECB gives us a, a, a very powerful tool for quantitative myocardial tissue characterization. So in some patient cases, here we have a woman who came in, 40-year-old female, with SD elevation and chest pain, normal coronaries at our emergent uh, coronary angiography, and she comes out to the MR scanner, and we see no scarring on late gadolinium enhancement, but an increase in T1 and an increase in ECV, and we, t we interpret this as an inflammatory process. Uh, in her case, it was uh, in the anterior wall in the midventricular uh, region, but not in the apex and not in the base, and we call that as an atypical uh, takotsubo, giving inflammation uh, in the myocardium without scarring and with normal coronaries and a concomitant uh, traumatic emotional uh, episode. Here we have a seven-year-old woman, uh, woman with a prior myocardial infarction in the lateral wall, which we see nicely on the late gadolinium enhanced image as this white spot here. We call that CI, chronic infarction. But in the, the other parts of the myocardium, uh, it's otherwise healthy. But on the ECV, we have an ECV of 34%, which is far above our upper limit of normal, but not so much an increase in T1 that we see in the diffuse myocardial fibrosis that we can see remote from a previous chronic MR. So a combination of T1 and, uh, and ECV is uh, powerful in our everyday uh, clinical use. And lastly, a little bit about myocardial perfusion. Uh, so typical of myocardial perfusion, uh, here we see uh, stress on the top, rest on the bottom, it's adenosine stress, and we have a, a basal, midventricular, and apical slice during the, uh, the through flush of a, of, a, of a contrast bolus. And we see that as the bolus arrives, the flush into the myocardium, we can let's see, watch it again here, it arrives first in the right ventricle, then in the left ventricle, and then it goes out and flushes the myocardium. If we stop it at one point, we see the region which has delayed arrival of the contrast. And this is the visually assessed perfusion that we do uh, both ourselves and you here at Pittsburgh on a routine basis with adenosine stress MR at stress and rest and call it perfusion abnormalities. But uh, that tells us if we have something focal going on and it's uh, been shown to be prognostically beneficial. But uh, this is a different patient now we have access to uh, quanti fully automated quantitative perfusion imaging. And here the color scale is now milliliters per minute per gram per tissue. That time series of the arrival of contrast has been mathematically um, uh, analyzed automatically to convert the, uh, the signal intensity changes over time into uh, milliliters per minute per gram. And here we see normal perfusion in all three slices at rest around one milliliter per minute per gram, which is normal. And then we see an increase in, to orange up to three, four uh, in, uh, during adenosine stress, but also we see the focal abnormality in this lateral wall uh, perfusion uh, defect. So this is powerful in that A, we get nice pretty color pictures, 
B, we can see in one image without having to look at the dynamics of what's going on. We get a number to see how, how bad that perfusion is, but also in normal myocardium. And we can see microvascular disease in patients that have no focal perfusion abnormalities, but only have a diffuse perfusion abnormality. And we, the, the data and the studies are ongoing now, but the, the ability to routinely see microvascular disease without having to do a PET or an invasive physiology study in the corner is, is something that is uh, um, very attractive. And I think, uh, I predict it will be something that will be um, putting microvascular disease in focus a little more than it has been. So in summary, when it comes to myocardial tissue characterization, we talked about myocardial scar. It could be ischemic or non-ischemic and highly prognostic and uniquely available in the MR scanner. We do T1 mapping to look at inflammatory processes and in combination with ECB, look at if it's, uh, if it's iron or fabry or diffuse fibrosis, focal fibrosis, amyloidosis, and myocardial perfusion now available quantitatively with uh, recent developments in the field to look at both focal abnormalities and diffuse abnormalities. Uh, so I'd like to transition from a snowpocalypse in Washington, D.C. to the, the Stockholm Archipelago. This is a 3 a.m. shot on midsummer morning uh, back in 2012. And we see now the, the sun coming up uh, in the east uh, and an absolutely burning horizon. And I think this, uh, the color scale reminds me a little bit of what we see in MR. And it also reminds me on a symbolic level of we have sort of a, a bright, burning, colorful future uh, on the horizon of, of MR in our transition from both black and white images to sort of color scale quantitative imaging. So we've talked about cardiac pumping uh, and myocardial tissue characterization together today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our collaborate, our, who we work with, our, our group here uh, in Stockholm and our collaborators, none the least uh, here at the University of Pittsburgh, which is an uh, important and valuable uh, collaborator for us. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Martin. That, that was great. Um, does anyone have any questions? I definitely have some questions. I have a brief one. Uh, with, the, with the tissue pumping, I was interested, do you, do you have any data on patients with severe conduction abnormalities? You mentioned how like the left ventricle seeps on the right ventricle. Uh, what happens in the context of profound left bundle branch loss? Do we know? Mm -hmm. uh, so we haven't done the studies of the septal contribution to stroke volume of the respective ventricles in left bundle. Uh, one can do that, and one can do it retrospectively on the data that we have. Uh, but uh, so specifically not. But uh, the, the the in echo, we know that there'll be a septal lateral wall delay in the strain, uh, and we've also we have an abstract coming up at the SCMR where we reproduced those kind of strain patterns uh, just by MR images, uh, and we've also shown that there can be quantified as the amount of desynchrony. Uh, I'm not sure that it adds much beyond echo, uh, but <clears throat> uh, that can certainly be seen and, and replicated in, in the MR model. But with regards to the septal contribution, that might be an interesting uh, uh, question to address, and we now have the tools to do it. So uh, and that, that was uh, the physiological, basic physiology background was sort of to, under, to now have tools to address things like that. So it's an open field. For you, Martin. Next <clears throat> talk, by the way. Uh, can you comment it on, you know, on echo, we assess that stellar function, right? And we talked a lot about the structure and how it relates to the function. How about the, the diastolic function assessment by cardiac MRI? Mm -hmm. Where are we at that? What are your thoughts? Uh, it, MR takes a little bit more time, but generally can do anything that you would want to do with echo, with some exceptions. Uh, we are interested in it as well. Um, the new 2016 guidelines, the atrial volume index, the E prime, and the E, and the TR velocity. Uh, we don't have right now a routinely available uh, assessment of PA pressure, pulmonary arterial pressure by MR. There are some methodologies that have been proposed uh, using four dimensional time resolved uh, or three dimensional time resolved flow, 40 flow by MR. Uh, and, um, we're exploring that uh, right now. <clears throat> I think it's important to include PA pressure assessment, uh, and I think it was wise to include it in the guidelines uh, for, for ECHO. Uh, but that's the, the missing link right now, and I think we'll see some uh, 
some work in that field in, over the next year or so. I look forward to it because it's a it's a missing part of MR right now. Yeah. With the our access to this technology is literally a, a couple months old, uh, so we haven't been able to do the studies just yet. Uh, but that's that's the those are the kinds of questions that uh, what are we what are we going to do with these microvascular dysfunction people? Um, cardiac syndrome X, for example. Um, now we have it's a lot of it, MR is sort of a rat race of developing new tools and then applying them. So right now the tools have just come. Let's. Uh, I think you might have someone who could uh, maybe address that. So one of the questions <clears throat> I had, I mean, it's impressive that the scope of, um, you know, sort of uh, functional assessment with structural assessment, and how tightly do you think those are correlated? Which, which do you think ultimately governs assessment of patient vulnerability? So uh, we, we did a, a number of studies on that. For example, how good is EF at predicting the amount of scar? It turns out it's horrible. You can have a horribly reduced EF with no scar at all, uh, and you can have tons of scar. You won't have tons of scar in a normal EF, but with it, in the setting of a reduced EF, you don't know which, which one it is. So there, and we know that the scar has stronger prognostic information. So scar beats EF. Uh, and then when it, regional function, how transmural is the scar whether we want to revascularize or not. Oh, we say on echo, we've been, we, I, have been fooled many a time. Thin right. wall, pumping poorly. We go to the MR lab, it's completely non-scar. Right. And the patient goes to revascularization and gets functional improvement. And in the, 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 the trial data that's been done where they did revascularize despite having scar, they didn't improve their function. So in regional function, in addition to global function, uh, tissue beats function. And then with ECV, uh, the data on not any focal scar, but now diffuse fibrosis. And that also literally beats the pants off ECV with prognosis. So I would say uh, if I had to choose between having a moving image and a still image showing me scar and or uh, diffuse fibrosis, I would uh, almost disregard the moving image. Do you think that's because uh, ejection fraction is just not the best surrogate of um, a function, you know, you were showing a lot of the, the longitudinal motion of the, you know, the atrioventricular plane, which I think kind of parallels echo data with, you know, global longitudinal strain. Yes. And do you think that we're just, we're chasing the wrong functional metric? I don't know. I think everybody that has problems pumping is going to, you're going to be able to see the pumping function with, with your pumping assessment. And that's sort of step one. If you don't have a problem pumping, then you don't have <clears throat> huge problems. The diastolic is a different. Uh, but once you have reduced pumping function, you want to know why. Right. That's where the, 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 the tissue characterization helps us. Yeah. So I think at, we need both. Yeah. Have you looked at amyloidosis um, with, with your total heart volume measurements? Because I always think of that as like the prototypic interstitial disease mm -hmm. that has you know attendant microvascular dysfunction and things like that. And you know, I've always been impressed by how bad AV plane motion is in, in amyloidosis. And I'm just wondering how that. You know, how, how well your those measurements pick up disease in, in amyloid? The short answer is no. We haven't looked at it. Uh, but once again, now we have the tools to do that. So let's yeah. uh, let's do it. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Thanks for thanks again. Appreciate it. Cool. Thank you for having me. Press stop there. Yeah.